I would never have guessed that the largest tsunami ever recorded occurred in the U.S. on the evening of July 9, 1958. A wave 1,720 feet tall rocketed through Latuya Bay in Alaska and demolished all previous records for the world's tallest wave. To put this in perspective, this is taller than the Empire State Building and over 12 times the height of the wave that hit Fukushima in 2011. But let's rewind a bit. Lutuya Bay was created when a glacier carved out the land, creating a shallow bay seven miles long and two miles wide. Native Americans were already living in and around the bay when Europeans first discovered the bay in 1786 and became acquainted with its destructive nature. It wasn't a tsunami they first met with, but a tidal board that wrecked two of the three small boats and drowned 21 men when exploring the entrance. We know now that other large waves occurred between the exploration of the bay and 1874, and that Native American Tlingit settlements on the shores were abandoned. Between 1890 and 1917, the U.S. mined gold in the sands near the mouth of the bay and used the bay as a port for mining operations. Afterwards, from 1917 to 1940, a man named James Huscroft lived in a cabin on Cenotaph Island in the middle of the bay. He was on the island when a giant wave hit in 1936 that reached a maximum height of 490 feet. James's account, and of the other people nearby, led to the first published account of the unusually big waves of Latuya Bay. The bay was incorporated into Glacier Bay National Monument in 1939, and nobody lived permanently in the bay from the time of James Huscroft's death in 1940 to the date of the 1958 wave, although it was used as an anchorage or bad weather refuge for fishing boats in the area. A geologist by the name of Don Miller sometimes stayed in James old cabin on the island to study the previous big waves. He was looking at the trim lines, lines where the vegetation changes sharply on the hillside, to learn more about the historical monster waves of the bay. Luckily, he was not there on the morning of July 9th on that fateful day, although there were a few fishing boats and mountaineers in the area. The mountaineers had encountered less than ideal conditions and so had turned back early and radioed to be picked up the following day. They had made camp on the shores of the bay. Their pilot arrived early, and the mountaineers left in a rush, just hours before the wave would hit. At 10.16 p.m., 125 miles of the Fairweather Fault ruptured nearby, moving approximately 21 feet horizontally and 3 feet vertically in an earthquake measuring 7.8 on the Richter scale. The three fishing boats remaining in the bay felt the earthquake hit, and the survivors estimated that it lasted somewhere in between 1 and 4 minutes. The Wagners who were on board their boat named the Sunmore lifted up their anchor and noped out of there, making their way to the entrance of the bay. Ulrich and his seven-year-old son aboard their boat, the Edry, could not get their anchor loose. He let out all of his anchor chain, started the boat's engine, and told his son to pray. On the Badger, the Swansons were startled awake by the shaking. An estimated one to two and a half minutes after the earthquake hit, the passengers of the fishing boats heard a deafening crash. The glacier seemed to move, and a truly enormous wave started in Gilbert Inlet at the head of the bay. It moved across a spur, hitting the shore on the south side of the bay, near Mudslide Creek, and then continued outwards towards the mouth of the bay. The speed of the wave was estimated to be somewhere between 97 and 130 miles per hour, and only took a few minutes after it was first sighted to reach the boats. Ulrich watched the wave come in. It lost some height as it barreled towards him, but by the time it reached him, it looked to be a wall of water 100 feet high. The boats were carried up the wave, snapping Ulrich's anchor free from his boat. The Swansons looked down from their perch at the top of the wave to see trees 80 feet below them. The waves pushed the Edry around, but miraculously Ulrich's boat weathered the wave and was deposited at the center of the bay with the motor still running. The Swansons were a bit less lucky. Their boat was wrecked, but they were able to escape on their skiff with nothing but a chair for a paddle. The Sunmore and the Wagners who were on board it were gone without a trace. Similarly, the cabin on the island and the lighthouse at Harbor Point at the mouth of the bay were gone, as though they had never existed. Before the wave, barnacles and mussels nearly covered the rocks in the intertidal zone on the island and the entrance to the bay. Afterwards, there were no shellfish to be found. The geologist, Don Miller, who had been studying the trim lines, heard of the wave the next day and flew back to Latuya Bay. 
He documented shorelines scoured down to bedrock, trim lines nearly 1,800 feet tall, and saw water still dripping from the bay's walls. Initially, his observation that the wave was 1,720 feet tall was met with skepticism. Others thought that the high trim lines were actually due to landslides, but ultimately treated roots at the edge of the trim line that showed water damage, the contrast of smaller landslides afterwards against the bare rock exposed by the wave, and the orientation of felled trees at the edge of the trim line showed that the wave had actually reached that high. Miller first thought the earthquake was the cause, but another scientist, Don Tocher, a seismologist at UC Berkeley, posited that a landslide could have caused the wave. Now enter R.L. Vigel, who built a 1 to 1,000 model of the incident and successfully recreated Miller's observations. He pieced the data together. There was a landslide of a volume of approximately 40 million cubic yards, or 90 million tons, in Gilbert's Inlet. There was a delay between the earthquake and the start of the wave. The pattern of trim lines that indicated the direction of the wave started at a point in Gilbert Inlet and moved out radially. Ultimately, the best explanation for the wave eight times larger than any tsunami measured to that point was the massive landslide and huge waves will almost certainly grace the shores of Latuya Bay in the future. Steep slopes and loose soils around the bay are the perfect place for future landslides. Don Miller estimates that there is a 1 in 9,000 chance of another giant wave on any given day. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe if you like our content and want to see more videos about the science behind natural disasters.